as usual, I'd like to start by sharing a map uh, in order to actually see the situation that we have right now uh, on the ground. This is basically the strategic situation. The main focus of the Russian effort is evidently, of course, Eastern Ukraine, namely this region here. Uh, so here in this Ukrainian pocket held in uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, the Russian strategic plan is to create kind of a cauldron in the Russian word Katyol uh, to encircle the Ukrainian units fighting here in this part of the front line. Heavy fighting has been going on since Monday. Uh, Russia has amassed altogether at least 89 battalion tactical groups and another 10, 12 are fighting around Mariupol. That will, the, these ones might also get redeployed uh, to this front line once uh, Russians put Mariupol's defense to an end. We will see how long it takes. In the upcoming days, fighting is going to intensify here in this region, also because the weather is clearing up. So this will uh, allow Russian air force to operate much more intensively than they have done uh, before. What's going on in Mariupol? The city has practically been uh, fallen to, to, to Russian occupation. Uh, defenders only hold the Azovstal plant, a major steel plant in the southern part of the city. Um, and, began, and because Russia, sorry, the separatist authorities declared, so Donetsk National Republic, quotation mark, of course. So Donetsk National Republic declared that they want to held a parade and on the 9th of May in Mariupol to, rem to commemorate Victory Day, by the 9th of May, Russians must clear Mariupol up. Russians must secure Mariupol, so um, defeat the remaining Ukrainian forces isolated there in the Azovstal plant. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like that uh, there is a high chance that they will be able to do that. Uh, Russia disagreed to the UN proposal of uh, an Easter ceasefire. There was an Orthodox Easter is coming this weekend, and there was a plan for a ceasefire and which would have helped to evacuate civilians from Mariupol. Russia firmly said no to this proposal. So um, the fighting in the city will continue, more meaning more and more suffering for the civilians yet still in the city. There are around 100,000 inhabitants, civilian inhabitants still logged in in, uh, in, in Mariupol. Um, up here in the north at Kharkiv region, so here Russia keeps shelling Kharkiv uh, Russia keeps uh, attacking Kharkiv, but no siege is planned. By now, Russia has basically uh, pushed back the Ukrainian counterattack that, has that, that was launched at the beginning of this week. So Russia is stabilizing its positions around Kharkiv, but the, the, the siege of the city is not on the Russian agenda. What's going on in the Black Sea? You, you all remember the news from last week, the, the big news from the Black Sea, the sinking of the Russian uh, missile cruiser Moskva. Um, losing the flagship has been a major defeat for Russia, both from the military perspective and also from the prestige perspective. We don't have uh, confirmed information about the fate of the crew. Uh, it's quite likely that more than 100 of them have surely perished, probably even 200. Uh, what does the loss of Moscow, of the Moscow cruiser, mean uh, for, uh, for Russia? Due to the threat from Ukrainian anti-ship missiles, the whole Russian fleet moved away from Ukraine's shores to a distance of more than 200 kilometers. This very move, namely that the Russian uh, fleet basically gets away from the shorelines, it actually confirms that yes, this was an anti-ship missile. Um, the Russian narrative on the sinking of the cruiser was that there was just kind of a fire breaking out and Ukraine had nothing to do with it. Well, had it been a fire, there would have been no reason for the whole Russian fleet to move away from the shorelines. Good news here, and now with Ukrainian anti-ship missiles evidently in operation, the threats of any invasion or any amphibious operation against Odessa have basically been reduced to zero. No, no sane Russian commander would send landing ships full of soldiers to the range of Ukrainian anti-ship missiles. So that's the good news here. Bad news, in Kherson, uh, Russian occupation authorities are planning to organize a referendum, so-called referendum, on the 27th of April, mainly next week. This referendum will surely be about mobilizing local population against Ukrainian fascists, quotation mark. And uh, the bad news here that by this referendum, Russia seems to repeat uh, the model it has used in Donetsk and Luhansk in 2014, 
namely to create a new kind of separatist quasi entity and use it as a reference point and also as kind of a quotation mark partner uh, for its operation uh, in, uh, in the Herzog region, possibly including even the recognition of a new Herzog uh, National Republic if Russia creates it. So by this referendum plans in Herzog, um, it looks more and more likely that whatever end uh, the war may take at a certain point, Russia is highly unlikely to give back the territories south of river uh, Dnipro, so these, this part, the southern part of the Kherson region, and also the southern part of the Zaporizhia region, but I'm pointing here with the mouse. Uh, so Russia is unlikely to give these territories back uh, in order to maintain the so-called land bridge between the Crimea and, uh, and, and Donetsk and uh, Russia's Rostov region, meaning uh, Ukraine is unfortunately highly likely to lose uh, access to the Azov Sea uh, full and complete. Uh, so this is my, my initial remarks, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer either here or in the chat. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, Stefan, I'll hand over to you. What's the importance of, of the date, the 9th of May? Is this war of attrition, or, or is it a sort of symbolic um, uh, victory that needs to be had under, under um, uh, quick speed? And, and, and what is the effect of, of, of the Moskva sinking? Um, but I'll, I'll leave you to your presentation, but just some of these questions, I think, are in people's minds. Stefan. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for also for organizing again this this meeting and um, uh, yeah, good, good morning also from my side. Um, I just I want to talk a little bit about sanctions and also the support for the war in, in, in Russia itself. But maybe just one uh, one thought on the 9th of May. I think we are quite focused on this date now in our debate. And I think we should not overestimate uh, the impact of the 9th of May. I think uh, it is driven, or the, the decisions by the Russians are driven by the war. So how the war is going. And if it's going well, uh, it, might be, it might go well beyond from the Russian side. Uh, beyond the ninth, yeah, and I think there might there are other dynamics I think which we should not uh, underestimate. So it does not mean that on the ninth this war will stop. Yeah, I think we also have this kind of debate. Uh, we should be very careful uh, on on uh, fixing or on focusing on 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 this state and and its impact uh, on on the war. Even if I also expect that Putin will declare a kind of a victory, whatever it means. Yeah. Um, just a couple of words, because I'm also working with a colleague on uh, on a paper of, on uh, comparing Iranian sanctions and uh, and, and Russian sanctions. Uh, just just looking a little bit into this topic. So my first point is this, the strong impact of the war on the relations between power and society and inter uh, elite relations in in Russia um, is is very visible. So if you're looking into Russia, sanctions will push back the Russian economy. Uh, to a level of the beginning of the 2000s. I think this is this is at the moment now discussed in Russia that also in, in, in many fields of the economy, it, 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 the, the, the benefits of the high oil and gas prices of the Putin era um, will, will be lost in many ways. And this will push back really the Russian economy uh, to, to a very low level. At the same time, these are the these are the most comprehensive sanctions towards such a big country we had we have ever seen. They are only comparable with the North Korean and the Iranian sanctions. Um, this is a comprehensive economic warfare. What we see here now from the Western side, um, and, and this kind of uh, sanctions policy has become a key tool of U.S. and EU policy since a couple a uh, couple of years. Uh, also with the with the um, decision not to intervene militarily in in a country and i think it's it's really a question how 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 much impact these kind of economic sanctions only economic sanctions have i think there are for the first time from the eu uh, us side and western side really very well prepared and coordinated. I think we have never seen such a stage of coordination and preparation of of, of comprehensive sanctions um, but if as Iranian sanctions also show um, that such large-scale sanctions lead to further securitization of a, of a regime. Security elites will first of all benefit from, from sanctions also economically. They get access to resources and it is often hardening the line of the regime. Uh, and the more you cut off the regime from the global economy, uh, the less impact 
you have on, on these kind of regimes. So I think there is a kind of an adaptation trap, yeah, which, which you, you also somehow create. Um, these kind of isolation and compre comprehensive uh, sanctions weakens the liberal elites um, and strengthens the hardliners in the system. I think this is also what, um, what, what Iran, for instance, shows. And as we observe in the Russian case, only Anatoly Chubais, I think we discussed him already two times, as part of the liberal elites, has distanced himself from the regime. All others stay in the system and work for the regime to survive economically. I think that's also important to, to, to mention. Consequences are isolation of Russia. Many in the elite understand that this is about their way of life, but they, they adapt. At the same time, we observe some criticism within the system. I think we see now more criticism within the system in Russia, but a lack of corrective mechanism. So there are no mechanism in the system to correct also decision making. Putin has become the only decision maker and nobody is really challenging him personally. The current situation increases the pressure on the elites to show loyalty, um, first of all, towards Putin himself and his decisions, even if they make no sense. So for, for many people, they are really nonsense, uh, but, but they, they, they show this kind of loyalty. Looking into the society, according to polls, 80% of Russians support the war and more than 70% Vladimir Putin. Um, but focus group discussions uh, by Levada show that people are afraid of consequences if they say what they really think. Uh, so these numbers reflecting rather what Russians think the political leadership expects from them to say as their real opinion. So uh, we, Levada and, and also other so sociologists, they, they, they say the real support for the war is much lower and also the real support for the regime is lower, but people, people don't want to express this because they are afraid of um, the consequences. We don't see this Crimea effect like in 2014, um, and the Russians really don't understand why this war or special operation is needed. Also the focus discussion groups show, they just don't, don't understand why, why this happens. And only the defense or liberation of, of Donbass makes sense for them. But why to go deeper into Ukraine and, and, and take all these costs? I think that that's also something which, which focus group discussions um, show. Um, in, the, in the current case, uh, the key question is if further sanctions and their costs will weaken the support for, for Ukraine and the sanctions in our societies, looking also to the Western side. In the case of Iran, the relevance for the global oil and gas market was much more limited, but Russian, Russia's uh, impact on the global uh, resources market, market is, is huge, which will have, uh, have high costs also for, for our societies. And in the case of Germany or also Italy and Austria, Russia is the key supplier of oil and gas, uh, and our co economic systems will suffer from it. Um, so, and, and I think the question is really also for our decision makers, Beside the fact that there will be more refugees uh, come from Ukraine and people will stay for a longer time also in, in, in Europe, um, uh, I think which is also the part of the calculation of the Russian side to, to push more and more refugees in. Um, how the growing prices for petrol, energy, um, possible loss of jobs might impact the support for sanctions in the German society. Any decision which is made for, for or against sanctions should not be driven by emotions or the media discourse, but the calculation how we can keep the, the support by our societies. I think that's really important to think here also in, in, in middle term. And only the combination of different instruments and tools, including sanctions, will have an impact. But we should not expect that in short term, a regime like the Russian regime will change their policy. Russia still has the escalation dominance, uh, and these photos have very limited impact on the Russian public. Um, there is a parallel reality which has been created successfully in Russia itself. And at the same time, looking on our side, every decision our political elites make should include also the assessment how long we can keep the support. And at the same time, it needs more and better explanation why we do, think, we do things like weapons supply and sanctions and what are the costs and where are the limits. I think um, if you want to keep support, 
explanation is very important and also adaptation uh, yeah in, in a way this 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 is a, this war is is uh, is changing and it needs an explanation in the public why it is changing and why it needs maybe different sanctions weapons supply and communication i think is is really key firstly to andrash two two questions um do we draw the correct lessons from the first stages of the conflict or are we too complacent about the strength of the Ukrainian forces and, and that kind of picks up on uh, Florence's question on deterrence in Odessa um, and the second question that came up was about western Ukraine and Kiev um, you said in the chat that, that you don't think that there'll be a sort of march back towards Ukraine um, but western Ukraine is nevertheless being targeted still partly in, in reprisals um, and that picks up on what Stefan was saying about refugees um, having a certain amount of sort of uncertainty there. Um, so I wanted to, to sort of broach those two questions to you. Did we, write, uh, did we learn the right lessons? Um, and uh, what do we need to watch out for in Central and Western Ukraine? Um, Stefan, for you, um, uh, you... You seem to still be open about the question whether this is a war of attrition or whether sort of quick victories are, are necessary. You say it sort of follows the flow of the war. Um, but of course, that has an impact on our decisions on um, whether to go for, for sort of hard hitting embargoes or whether we supply heavy arms. Um, so I wonder sort of uh, on, on, on these two sort of fields, um, what we should be concentrating most on, what are the sort of practical things that we can we can be doing uh, there and maybe you could say, and this may have come up in, in previous sessions, um, more about the sort of disappearing elites in Russia, the, the sort of Shoigu, Beseda, Avayev, Gavrilov, Surkov, the, these people who, who seem to have disappeared or, or make a sort of chance appearance back again. Um, uh, so yeah, if you can if you can address some of that, that that would be helpful, and then we'll we'll move across. And if you see things in the chat come up, then then please do answer them. Uh, Andras, you. All right, thank you. So on the question whether we have drawn the right lessons, well, to be honest, I'm positively surprised by the performance of the West, meaning both the EU and the United States. I mean, uh, once the, the initial shock of the few days of the attack were over, uh, the EU re has reacted with surprising coherence. So, I mean, if we compare it to 2014, or if we compare it particularly to the war in Georgia in 2008, we are faring really well. But this doesn't mean that, uh, that we should be, become any kind of lenient. I mean, the hard part is just starting. I mean, attrition is taking an effect also in Ukraine's armed forces. Uh, we know practically nothing about the state of the Ukraine's armed forces. Ukrainian communication is absolutely closed on that. However, by kind of reverse engineering the Ukrainian pleas for heavy weaponry, Ukraine's request from heavy weaponry, uh, it seems to be quite sure that Ukraine is also taking heavy losses both in terms of military hardware, also in terms of trained personnel, plus Ukraine is gradually running out of fuel because Russia has been systematically uh, depleting uh, and downgrading Ukraine's uh, fuel industry. Ukraine is running out of repair capacities because Russians are destroying Ukrainian military industry. So Ukraine desperately needs our help and will need our help even more. The, the danger I see here is that we, we need to make sure that our public, the Western public, doesn't get tired of the war, doesn't get used to the war, doesn't get kind of bored uh, by, by, by the war. So we need to keep uh, attention at a very high level. On the situation of, uh, of Central and Western Ukraine, yes, Russia is going to continue air attacks and missile attacks. However, any kind of land intrusion is, uh, is highly, highly unlikely. Yes, the Belarusian armed forces are still lined up uh, along the border of Belarus. However, the Belarusian armed forces are unable to move without direct involvement of the Russian army. There are a number of technical reasons to that. Uh, to put things in short, in order to launch any large-scale offensive operations, the Belarusian army would need uh, direct Russian command and control support, and Russia does, uh, does not have the capabilities necessary for that. So Belarusian army will stay where it is, um, but at the same time, air and missile attacks will continue. Moreover, probably Russia is going to try to kind of upgrade its uh, human capacities on the ground to attack uh, Western military shipments coming through Western Ukraine. So um, the victory is very far uh, yet at, at present. 
no ground attack, but everything else. Thank you. My, my main point is, I think we, we often have to, this tendency to focus on one tool to impact um, on, on regimes. So we sanction now the regime or we supply rams and we supply weapons or in the past we did not supply really weapons. And I think um, there's a there is a very reactive uh, uh, policy also at the same time. So I think um, we, on, on one hand, we should not overestimate sanctions. I think it's it, their impact, and there's a, there, it was also mentioned in the chat, there is a huge literature also on, on, on economic sanctions, economic warfare, I think which shows that um, the impact is really limited. Uh, and it often uh, isolates regimes, hardens the regimes, and strengthens those uh, people, those groups uh, in authoritarian states or in the target uh, countries, uh, which 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 are not for change, but which benefit also from from these kind of sanctions. This does not mean that we should not sanction. I think it's also a kind of punishment. It is also a kind of a signal. But I think it's often a policy not to do other things. Um, yeah, not to to intervene, not to uh, not to supply um, uh, maybe uh, 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 offensive weapons, whatever it means. Yeah, I think you have uh, all weapons are can you can be used in, in on both sides. So, and I think there is a need for rethinking, in my opinion, this whole um, sanctions policy, which has to be one tool in the in the in the in the toolbox combined with other tools. Um, and and again, what the point I also made. Uh, we should also think about the costs in our societies and the support for our policy, um, which can 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 quickly decline if if prices are growing, yeah, and, and and so on. So my impression is that we often use sanctions because of a lack of a other strategy. Um, we are not willing to pay other costs, and we 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 are not, yeah, we I don't know, we we have this kind of um, uh, dynamic also. In our policies, who, who is making this kind of Russia policy, for instance, in the US or Iran policy in the US, who is driving it, for instance, or maybe also in our systems? Yeah, but I think there is the main driver for this kind of, of sanction policy. And then it's the questions who is who participates also in this kind of decision making. And I think it needs really a more comprehensive strategy. Uh, if we can expect more of this kind of conflict. So I try to bring this on a different level Yeah, at the, at the moment. Um, uh, to to really impact and strengthen at the same time maybe also groups in the system which 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 opt for change which is very difficult and it's very tricky I might not have an answer how to do it but I think we really need system more systematically to think about how to develop sanctions and other tools in 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 a, in a different in in a different way um, so on the disappearance of of the elite in Russia. Um, I think there are several elements. We, the, the one point I mentioned is this loyalty. We have like like uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the former super liberal um, uh, president, who is now a hardliner, has become a hardliner in the system, and shows really this kind of loyalty uh, to 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 the systems. You can see with him, but also with others in the systems, that they are playing a role. That they they have a they have a they have a like a. So they, they are like puppets in the system, which which uh, which which takes or, or actors which takes takes some some kind of responsibilities in the system, but they are not decision makers by themselves. And I think that's also a, a main failure of our thinking and policy. Also, when Medvedev was president, these huge hopes that the, the, he's a liberal president. He had he they were the Kremlin was creating a liberal image for him. Now he's creating, uh, uh, also uh, with the support maybe of some P PR people, um, a hardliner image. I think that's that's already quite a while. So, and you, you, the, the problem is that there are very few really players in the system, and um, and the, the drive um, in the last years was that Putin is the, the main decision maker for everything, and 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 other people are just instruments in the system. So, and um, I'm not so sure how much it makes sense to discuss the appearance and disappearance of some people. I think they are all instruments uh, in, in the system and they, they might drive also with their backgrounds, uh, 
KGB, military, um, whatever background, some kinds of, of policy. But it is a very small circle of decision makers, or it's very small, let, let's call them more advisors around Putin who impact on, on decision makers. And this, this focus on Putin and, and that he has become the person you have to be loyal to, that everybody is vulnerable in the system, even people close to Putin, um, makes it a very intransparent, very closed system, which is very difficult to follow. And I think um, a lot of these appearance and disappearance things, they are just a manipulation also of, of our discourse, uh, distraction also from, from what is really happening in the system. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's a very tricky thing also for, for, for analyzing um, the dynamics in, in, in the system. Well, thank you both very much. And as I say, um, Andras and, and Stefan remain part of this conversation. So if you have further questions um, in the second half for them, then, then feel free to, to make them. Um, for the second half, as, as you can see from the, the invitation we sent around, we, we wanted to deal with political cohesion inside the European Union. Um, we had originally thought of this in, in terms of um, uh, the after effects of, of the Hungarian uh, elections and uh, the upcoming uh, French elections. So we deal with, with Hungary and in France, um, but frankly, with, with what's been happening in the German debate over the last few days, um, I think it would have been silly not to put um, Germany and France together on, on this part of the panel. So that's what we've done. We've asked um, Dana to say a word about um, uh, possible energy embargo and the debate around that, and Jakob will talk to us about um, the situation in France um, going into the second round of the presidentials. Um, Dana, kick us off, please. Thank you, Roderick, um, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as a preparation for our discussion, I would like to highlight four key arguments on uh, why Germany should actually support a European embargo on Russian oil and gas, uh, additionally to the already decided coal embargo, and why such a European embargo could also increase European security in general. Um, first of all, the embargo is possible, as uh, many experts has, uh, have already pointed out, if um, the, the uh, embargo is combined uh, with a reduction of uh, the demand of gas that could be achieved partly with the help of other uh, sources of energy, but also partly by um, gas supplies from other countries, which would mainly mean LNG supplies. Uh, my second point is that although the embargo would cause uh, obviously economic costs, um, it is even indicated from an economic perspective. Um, the payments uh, for Russian energy imports may not directly finance the Russian war because they are not paid in rubles so far. However, these payments could still be used as foreign exchange to pay mercenaries, for example, and there, were, there was at least indirectly support the Russian aggression. Furthermore, the payments um, also have the effect that they stabilize the Russian ruble, and uh, therefore the continuance of the Russian energy imports actually would weaken the effect of these sanctions that are already into force. Um, therefore, the financial resources that are resulting from the energy exports actually help Russia to continue its aggression, and therefore these should be seized immediately. Um, the damage to the German economy would actually be higher if Russia remains uh, a serious security threat and uh, could even expand its aggression in the long term, and therefore um, the uh, embargo is also indicated from the economic perspective, as I said. My third point is um, that the embargo is obviously also politically indicated. Germany especially needs to increase its political um, credibility by cutting off all economic ties with Russia. Um, this uh, becomes apparent, especially in comparison to France. Um, the German position here is politically especially weak due to its uh, energy dependence on Russia. As uh, my colleague Jacob will point out soon, France is highly independent from foreign energy imports due to the French nuclear energy strategy. Although this nuclear energy strategy is not the solution for the German uh, situation in the current energy crisis and also not the solution for the European energy crisis, the French way of energy independence in general needs to be highly acknowledged here. 
um, a comparable energy uh, independency should also be aimed at at the European level. The independence from Russian energy supplies uh, increases the national uh, security and also the European security. At the moment, Russia has the power to cut the EU off its supplies at any time, and this is a very high risk. So therefore, the EU should concentrate on becoming actively independent from Russian supplies, and there was also, uh, also increase the European uh, security in the long term. Lastly, and um, this is the most important point I would like to raise here in climate terms, um, the embargo could also mean an important push towards accelerating the energy transition and also achieving the climate goals. It could be used um, as an incentive to switch to climate friendly technologies, for example, um, the rapid replacement of old boilers in private households but also the expansion of public transport and uh, financing of public transport as has already happened in, in Germany and many other European countries. And also the expansion of renewable energies that has already been started, but should be expanded much more and much faster. The industries could be pushed to find alternatives in their production processes from uh, fossil fuel energies. The climate crisis will force us to make these cuts anyway as fast as possible. Uh, carbon emissions need to be reduced by 65% in Germany and 55% uh, within the EU until 2030. These carbon emissions mainly result, as we all know, from the fossil fuel uh, use. So it would be actually better to use this crisis to switch to climate-friendly alternatives and thereas meet the climate goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, this could actually uh, introduce the Zeitenwende that has been uh, called by Olaf Scholz in climate terms and could assert our future and also the future of following generations. So I think I stop here and uh, I look forward to our discussion in the Q&A and uh, your opinion on this topic. Thank you. Bless you, Dana. You've been, you've been super quick. I might, I, I'm, I'm going to come in with too many questions while, while that's fresh in people's minds. Um, the, the first is is what numbers you're you're using on um, on that sort of balance between Russian aggression and the costs of war and uh, the embargo. Can can you give an indication on 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 the sums we're talking about and, and that calculation? Um, and, and maybe just to to pick up on the on the nuclear issue as a foreigner, um, why why is nuclear not the the, the right response for, for Europe, and maybe as a sub point, just how independent is nuclear as a, certainly as a, as a source of fuel, but also technology, how, how much do we have sort of strategic autonomy in, in Europe on that? If you could just answer this super quickly, just while, while that's, that's uh, fresh in people's minds, that'd be kind. Uh, yeah, thank you. So first of all, the economic costs that I was referring to, um, uh, the calculations that I've seen, um, of course, um, are very different. But um, what I've read so far, um, the economic cost would be comparable or, or the decrease of economic growth would be, would be comparable um, to the effects of the COVID pandemic. So of course there would be economic costs, um, but it would actually be bearable uh, for the European economy and also the German economy. They, there's a need of financial aid, uh, obviously, um, in the industry, but also um, for private households um, uh, that are not um, not able to yeah, to cover these um, extra um, costs. Um, but yet this, this would be possible as the Council of Economic Experts uh, in Germany, the Wirtschaftsweise already pointed out, also the Leopoldina. So there are actually many renowned experts um, that have uh, done these calculations and came to this conclusion. Um, to your second question on the nuclear strategy. So uh, in Germany, uh, the nuclear energy is not uh, an alternative because we already um, started the process of uh, shutting down nuclear plants and uh, all uh, the uh, German uh, nuclear uh, suppliers 
already pointed out that it would be too expensive to um, to rise up the nuclear energy, uh, and it's actually not possible for them economically. So therefore, there's no alternative in nuclear energy in Germany. And the same uh, applies to many other European countries. But what I was referring to was mainly the German situation here, because uh, the discussion in Germany uh, has been a very, um, well, uh, wild <laughs> on nuclear energy, but has been cut off uh, in my uh, eyes at least uh, by the statement of the German suppliers. Uh, since we're dealing with political uncertainty, I think I'll come back to you on a, on a couple of questions on the distribution of the costs um, uh, between between war and, and and the sort of energy embargo, and then the, the politics around uh, nuclear in in Germany and, and transition. Um, but Jakob, to to come to you, um, we've dealt a bit with with Germany. Tell tell us about France. What are the uncertainties around the the French position on Russia going into the the second round? Thank you, Roderick. And thank you, uh, Dana, as well. Um, maybe before I turn to the uh, TV debate and the French elections, a quick comment on, on this uh, whole nuclear topic, uh, since it's fresh, as you said, Roderick. And uh, now um, it has been in the discussion, uh, including throughout the campaign, and um, President Macron um, has pointed, has, has avoided to point to immediately to, towards Germany, but there has been this overtone in the French uh, discussion that uh, they say, well, look at Germany, look at their dependence on fossil fuels, uh, and look at us uh, with our comparative independence um, with regards to, to nuclear energy. And so I, I think this very well feeds into the broader narrative that uh, Mr. Macron has been pushing throughout the five past years on strategic autonomy, on, on sovereignty, uh, including in the energy sector. So this is actually helping helping uh, him in his position. Uh, but maybe we can come back to this uh, during the debate. Um, so to, to turn uh, to the presidential elections um, that have at times been eclipsed by the war in Ukraine, um, uh, this changed very much uh, in the run up to the first round on, on April 10th, um, when consumer prices, uh, the fear of inflation, uh, purchasing power uh, of the French uh, citizens became very much the heart of, of the debate and has been ever since, really. Uh, it has been as well in yesterday's TV debate that uh, opposed uh, President Macron and uh, uh, his challenger, uh, Marine Le Pen. Um, the war in Ukraine and the debate on energy prices that uh, Dana explained for, for Germany uh, were very much part of the debate yesterday as well. Um, they are obviously linked, the war and, and this debate on energy prices. Um, but um, for my presentation, I want to, to start by, by giving a quick uh, impression how things went yesterday uh, in this debate, uh, what role the one Ukraine played, what, what role, um, um, what was discussed by the two candidates with regards to Ukraine, with regards to European uh, cohesion in the European Union. Um, and then lay out probably what uh, an electoral win uh, by uh, President Macron uh, would mean for Ukraine, for the European Union position towards Russia, and what uh, uh, it would mean if uh, Marine Le Pen gets elected on Sunday. Um, to the TV duel yesterday night, most neutral observers saw a much more balanced situation than back in 2017 when we had the same debate. Uh, and when Marine Le Pen came largely unprepared, was perceived as too aggressive towards Macron. Um, but I don't think the, the debate yesterday uh, is decisive uh, as such. The polls give uh, President Macron currently at around 55 to 56 percent, uh, leading uh, over Le Pen, who is uh, accordingly given uh, 44 to 45 percent for, for Sunday. Um, regarding the war in Ukraine, Russia's aggression, um, Le Pen's connections to the Kremlin, to Vladimir Putin personally, were obviously discussed in detail. That has been one angle of attack for, for President Macron uh, throughout the past days. Um, yesterday, he coined this, this very iconic uh, phrase that when Le Pen uh, talks to Russia, she's talking to her banker. So he was referring to, to credit that she was given for her campaign in 2017 back in 2015, and uh, this credit is not yet fully reimbursed. So there's this question if 
she can take independent decisions uh, on Russia uh, towards Vladimir Putin. Um, and the war in Ukraine and the debate on, on unity in the European Union um, towards the Russian aggression were the second topic actually discussed yesterday, just after the, the questions on purchasing power, um, which in itself, again, is uh, uh, linked to the war, but uh, we might come back to this later. So to discuss the, the, the scenarios, first of all, uh, President Macron gets re-elected on Sunday. Uh, what would that mean again for, for Ukraine, for uh, French policies towards Russia? Um, there have, has been a lot of attention again uh, on Marine Le Pen, on her entanglement with uh, Russia, with Russian banks, and rightly so. But let's not forget that Emmanuel Macron uh, pushed a rapprochement policy towards Russia for the past five years. Um, Madame Le Pen, she, she, she uh, based her counterattacks uh, uh, against Macron on this fact yesterday night as well. Uh, just one example to, to underline this, it was Macron and it was the, the French who were uh, the major drivers behind uh, Russia coming back into the Council of Europe in 2019. So I think there's a historical fascination in a sense, a willingness to approach Russia, uh, with, which seems to be deeply entrenched in the subconscious of the fifth French Republic. And I would argue um, exists really across the, the whole political spectrum in France. While Russia's renewed aggression of Ukraine has certainly been a major blow to uh, President Macron's um, plan to reintroduce Russia to this so-called European uh, security architecture, I do not think that this plan uh, is off the table if he wins the, the, the election on Sunday. Um, Again, to underline this, yesterday he confirmed his willingness uh, on this question to, first of all, do anything he could to de-escalate the conflict. And second of all, and more interestingly, that France, France uh, should continue to play its traditional role as a puissance d'équilibre, so a non-aligned or balancing power, and that Russia had to be brought back to reason, I quote. All in all, uh, President Macron has managed to evade the most difficult questions, such as would the sanctions regime, would these, this embargo that we discussed be lifted immediately after uh, the conflict in, in Ukraine ends? Uh, and instead, he has been attacking uh, Marine Le Pen for her obvious entanglements uh, with Russia. So that brings me to, to the second scenario. Uh, Marine Le Pen gets elected on, on Sunday. Uh, she gave an entire press conference on her foreign policy program last week. Her stance towards Russia was obviously at the center of interest for the, the questions coming from the media. Um, she has avoided repeatedly condemning Russia, Vladimir Putin, the war crimes uh, in, in Ukraine. She has instead stated her unconditional solidarity with the Ukrainian people and its fight for uh, a, a sovereign nation. Um, in her program, Le Pen announces that uh, she would want France to regain a main libre, as she calls it, so a free hand in, in international affairs, uh, for France to be unrestricted by uh, alliances. Uh, as you know, she wants to leave uh, NATO's integrated command, and she's very hostile to uh, the European Union as it stands uh, today. So if she gets elected, um, my last point, this would obviously immediately be a win for uh, Russian positions in, inside the European Union for Russian propaganda that has been very active in pushing uh, these forces across uh, the European Union that insist on their status as a sovereign nation state, uh, which are critical of uh, multilateral cooperation. Um, France's contribution to NATO would, would suffer it is unclear how rapidly uh, Madame Le Pen would, would implement her program with regards to that. If she would pull back uh, French troops, for instance, from the, uh, the eastern flank, from uh, Romania. Um, but the biggest blow, uh, I would say, would be dealt to the European Union um, uh, with regards to several questions that we don't really have time to discuss in detail, just to give a quick a list. Uh, Schengen and free movement inside the European Union would certainly be at stake. The European Union's effort to build a more integrated security and defense cooperation, including towards the Russian aggression, uh, would probably be dead. Um, uh, Le Pen has repeatedly stated uh, to end that uh, the Franco-German couple as a force of integration, as an engine for European integration, is an illusion. 
and that she wants to end that illusion. And just to, to wrap up and to summarize maybe on, on the French position towards Russia, I want to quote a former uh, French diplomat, um, Michel Duclos, um, who, who said in a book he, he published recently, and I quote, for us, so for the French, the relationship with Russia is mostly a diplomatic game. In Germany, Poland, Sweden, and elsewhere in Europe, there are much more concrete economic and security issues at stake. And I think this, this summarizes it very well. And we can get back to what that means uh, for European cohesion, maybe in the discussion. Thank you. Dani, you've got a couple of questions on how honest the, 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 the nuclear debate is um, in Germany in the chat. It would be good if you could pick up on those. I'd also be interested, and this picks up on, on something that I think Jakob was hinting at, to the degree to which perhaps the, the French are, are hiding behind the, the Germans also when it comes to an energy embargo, um, or because of fears of, of you know rising cost of living, um, uh, which has really played out in, in this election. So I, I wonder if that's the case. Um, Jakob, a couple of questions to you. Um, firstly, to what degree um, across the political spectrum in France is Germano skepticism growing at the moment, looking at Germany's response to, to Ukraine? Is that an issue? Um, uh, whether it be action towards Ukraine or the question of, of sort of EU funding of the cost of living, energy transition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, secondly, you didn't mention Africa, but that's something we've discussed in the past, and that's also a theater where, where France is competing with um, Russia. Has that come up in this election? How do you think that will change? Um, and thirdly, if you could say a word more about um, uh, Macron's idea of a sort of non-aligned France and what role he thinks France would play in any potential sort of settlement negotiations with Russia um, and whether he would take a common line with the rest of the EU and Germany, or would be trying to make concessions that Germany and the rest of the EU aren't in a position to make. Um, and Stefan, the reason I wanted to, to bring you in was um, uh, a, a little bit this this question of um, you talked before about the need for a, for a comprehensive German policy towards Russia, of which you know sanctions and embargoes and so on were, were just one part. I, and I wanted to bring you in at the end. Um, to, to say a word or two about how you you think that could play out, because that's also central to the to the communication of um, costs and pain to um, the German population. So maybe that's a way of, of pulling this together um, at the end. Um, Dana, um, two or three minutes if you could. Sorry, I know we've got big questions there. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, first of all, to the question of um, how honest the nuclear discussion in, in Germany is. Um, well, I'm, I'm uh, obviously not, not uh, an engineer on, on nuclear energy, but um, as I've learned from, from experts, uh, it's actually not possible uh, once uh, a nuclear plant um, started to slow down and be cut off. To, uh, to rise the energy production of the plant again. Um, and that is also why the economic costs of increasing nuclear energy would be so high. Um, because uh, as I've learned, um, the uh, Iran uh, resources would need to be replaced soon. Uh, and so that would um, drive up costs uh, enormously. Um, therefore, I think at least in the, in the short term, uh, these uh, discuss discussions are actually honest. Um, because uh, it's simply an economic fact. Um, in, in the long term, when it comes, because I, I've seen in the chat somebody raised the issue whether um, there should be um, uh, an overall change in nuclear strategy. Um, I think uh, that's simply not, not feasible from a political perspective, uh, as um, has already also been said in the chat. Um, but also is not should not really be aimed at um, uh, from uh, a security perspective because uh, as we've seen uh, also in Ukraine uh, nuclear energy is, is a, a very um, high security risk and also with um, the uh, Russian uh, uh, yeah imminent security threat I think we simply shouldn't um, shouldn't risk uh, continuing nuclear energy. Um, and uh, I think this is a, a, actually a, a very um, 
great achievement of German policy um, that they managed to uh, decide upon the withdrawal. Um, so I think, um, yeah, that's actually uh, a good point here uh, and we should not uh, change these policies. Um, regarding your question of France uh, maybe hiding behind Germany, uh, I've actually also been wondering about that um, because there have been speculations uh, that um, uh, um, an oil embargo at least might come into force after the French elections. Um, so that yeah, it may be, may not uh, jeopardize uh, the um, possible um, win of Macron, hopefully. Um, but uh, still, um, there have been uh, talks backdoors. Uh, I mean, those are only speculations. There is nothing um, nothing uh, um, official here. Um, but um, yeah, I think that might be the case. Um, but also, um, yeah, I don't know whether. Um, whether France needs to hide behind Germany because they actually also have a point when it comes to energy independence. And um, this should be a very, um, yeah, a very great uh, aim for, for EU in general to achieve energy independence. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Jakob, sorry, I threw big questions at you, but if, if you could sort of pick one or two for, for two or three minutes, that would be grand. Thank you. All right. Well, First of all, on, on Germano skepticism, as, as you called it, I think it, it has been very present uh, in the uh, campaign so far, but mainly due to, to Marine Le Pen. Uh, she repeated um, her skepticism, her positions on this illusion of Franco-German uh, cooperation uh, and its worth for European integration uh, yesterday. Um, it's funny to take note as well that in France, uh, Brussels is perceived, at least if you listen to uh, Le Pen, but also to Mélenchon, who came third in the first round, uh, Brussels is perceived to be absolutely dominated by Germany, whereas in Germany, uh, frankly, in Berlin, um, Brussels is, is mostly perceived as dominated by the French at the moment. So, um, well, you, you have both sides of, of the picture, but um, I don't think that apart from uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, 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 Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who are very skeptic uh, towards Germany, um, this this would be a major problem. If uh, uh, Macron gets re-elected, he, he will certainly continue to, to draw on the big su successes he achieved uh, with Germany as well. I mean, you had the signature of the Treaty of, of uh, Aachen, but you also had the Recovery Fund, uh, the Common European Debt, that he presented again yesterday as a major achievement of French diplomacy, of, of the his uh, policies in, in uh, Europe. And so I, I would expect um, this good cooperation in a sense to, to continue for the for the next five years if he gets re-elected. Um, maybe on, on Africa, the question um, um, that, that came up in the debate yesterday, and I think it doesn't come up um, um, as much as it should uh, in Germany. I think we, we see uh, the beginning of the discussion about the, the Mali um, a presence of the Bundeswehr and how this is linked to the whole uh, discussion on Zeitenwende. I saw yesterday that there was this call to, to organize a public discussion um, uh, in the realm of the parliamentary discussion, which will take place in May on the Bundeswehr uh, mandate in Mali. And I think Mali is a good case in point that the French view on this whole war in Ukraine, uh, Russian aggression is a bit more global than the German one. Uh, the French know that they are confronting Russia and Russian interests, not only in Ukraine and on NATO's eastern flank, but also on the African continent in Western Africa, where Russia has been very active in, in, in pushing uh, influence campaigns, uh, propaganda against the French uh, presence there, is trying to revive uh, stereotypical uh, uh, pictures of, of the French colonial state as being present in Western Africa. And with a, a, a great deal of, of success really in Mali. I mean, the Malian population is now convinced that um, they are witnessing some kind of uh, colonization, recolonization by France and that uh, Russia is the go-to partner. We will see how this plays out for the security situation uh, in, in Mali. But again, uh, I think um, this is something that's much more present in the French discussion. And I think the German discussion would benefit by opening up uh, 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 their view on, on Russia's presence, on Russia's influence on international relations, um, from keeping in mind what, what, what they are doing in Ukraine, certainly, but also discussing what they are doing uh, in places like Mali, but also 
um, um, uh, Mozambique, for instance, or other uh, uh, countries in Africa. Yeah. Last word to, to you, Stefan. I'd also say there's been a question about what actually motivates Russia in, in, in this stage of the war. So it's kind of a question to you, what, what motivates Russia and, and what should motivate Germany when, when we're thinking about a sort of comprehensive approach? What, what should German aims be? You have two, two minutes to answer that rather big question. Good luck. Um, I think uh, Andras already answered a little bit uh, this this one question. So uh, and we discussed it also sev several times. So I think there is about this historical mission, but it's also about spheres of influence. Um, so I don't need to answer this, but I think I just want to point on on, on the second part on China to put maybe China more under under pressure um, to impact on on Russia. I think on one the first point is uh, China will not allow to to get put under pressure. Um, uh, and, and I think they, they they agree also with with this kind of sovereignty policy of Russia. And second, I think it will be much more cost much more costly for us also to put, for instance, economically China under pressure. So I think there will be a, a very limited um, um, uh, willingness uh, to to do so. Um, I just want to point out because I, I'm also looking a little bit on on, on Wagner in, in Africa. Um, uh, I think what we can see is that Russia is a is somehow a successful spoiler power. Yeah, it's not an order power; it's a, it's a spoiler power, um, and um, it is really low cost. So it's also business what Wagner is doing there. Um, uh, and um, and I think um, what is really successful, I think uh, Jakob mentioned this, um, the unpopularity of France in Africa. So you can you can say part of it is Russian propaganda. But I think it's also the legacy of French policy in in Africa, which plays in in the in the hands also of the Russian propaganda. Yeah, so I think propaganda is often more successful when there is a there is a resonance uh, area, and I think it is there. Yeah, and I think that's something we really should um, we should also France should should think about and and discuss where where this 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 comes from. Um, then I just wanted one one footnote if uh, on gas. If I'm looking into this Leopoldina study, which is always quoted. I think for me it doesn't work, to be honest. So I'm I'm not a climate expert, but I'm looking into energy since many years. But I I think and this 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 study has also been criticized um, on, on 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 several from several uh, serious uh, people. I don't think there is really sufficient gas like it is described in the study. I'm I'm really skeptical. I think I think it's something also which has has uh, which should be discussed. And on your question, um, uh, Roderick, um, with Germany. Um, I think it's 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 like always very complex. I think there is there is this Scholz factor with who 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 does not want to get in in a kind of a um, conflict uh, with, with his own party or not too too big conflict. So he he tries to balance between different interests in his own party uh, and maybe also in parts of the society. Um, then I think there is this this understanding also in in Germany not escalate with Russia. So don't go too far with Russia. I think there is there is this kind of of of, um, of of policy being very careful also in in, in dealing with Russia, um, and, um, uh, and 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 it, it's also about keeping the support. I think for for, for sanctions. But I think um, Scholz is a person who does not want to take really risks. Um, so he's he's really um, he he tries to I don't know to get. Yeah, to, to do, and I think Germany is doing a lot of, yeah, I think we should also um, say this, I think Germany is doing a lot of, paying a lot of money um, and, and supplying weapons. It has shortages also, but it could do much more if, it's, it, if it would be um, more pragmatic in many ways. Um, uh, and it, there would be a clear decision to, to do what is really necessary. I think this is for me rather rhetoric from Scholz that we are doing the necessary things. Uh, uh, I, I think it's really keeping the balance between um, non-escalation interest groups and doing uh, and, and, and keeping the damage from Germany in a way. So it's not a very strategic policy. It's a very reactive policy still in my opinion. Um, and, um, and it's not, it's not uh, not leading on 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 this uh, on this issue, but just getting pushed by by others, and I think that's really a German German problem also. How to come out of this situation where you are driven 
by the dynamics on the ground and by your partners um, and by Mr. Putin in the end, yeah? Um, and I, I think, um, I think there, there, th we are discussing so many details in talk shows and, and then it's the, the Ukrainian ambassador and so on. I think there's a lack really of a serious strategic debate in Germany. What is our goal? What is our goal with regard to Russia in short term, middle term, long term, with regard to our Eastern neighborhood? Um, and and it's, it's again a very detailed German discussions and, and distraction from the, from the key questions in my opinion. Um, uh, and, and then this developing a maybe a more comprehensive strategy and then also the toolbox which is needed for it. Um, and, and media is rather distracting or the media then then supporting this kind of, of, of debate. That's my impression, yeah, my, my personal uh, impression. And I think all this creates this mix of um, a very typical German muddling through uh, re reaction policy in, in, in a way, even if it's much more, much more um, uh, investing now also in, in, in supply for Ukraine than it would have, have ever have done before and in, in taking more costs also. And amen to that. Um, I, I'm going to call this to a, to a close, um, uh, though I, I have a feeling that we could have gone on for a lot longer. Um, thank you all very much to, to the speakers and, and to you for participating. Um, and we will have, I hope that, um, strategic debate um, uh, perhaps next week. Um, and we hope to see you there. Um, thank you and have a good day.